the first star party that we've ever had here. And I want to tell you that, that why I'm doing this is because I really like science. And I think it's important. So all of you guys are junior scientists. You have your logos and everything. So how many adult scientists do we have in the audience? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, okay. How many PhDs do we have? Two? Dr. Marino? Yes. And Dr. Bryn? Okay. <laughs> PhD is when you study a long time, and L is... And it piles higher and deeper. <laughs> <laughs> but that means that you've become a scientist, and, and you, they call him doctor. So in the Cosmos Research Center, we call him Dr. Bryn or Dr. Moreno. Even if it's your mother, you have to call her doctor during the center. Okay. Well, one of the things about science is observing, okay? And what, what, that's what you have notebooks for. So when you learn something, you put it down in your observations, okay? And then we'll, we'll, if we want, we'll put this on the computer and you can do this on the computer system someday. Well, we have a scientist here, Dr. Bryn, and he's a, uh, a physicist and a writer, and he's a father of a couple of you guys here too. But he has to leave pretty soon, so I thought we'd let him talk right now. And one of the things he does is he studies outer space and whether there's life out in outer space. So I've asked him to talk about whether there's life in outer space. So he's one of the world's experts to talk about this. So, and if you want to read a book, he can write, you read, give you some books to read too. So anyway, Dr. Brin, would you like to tell us about whether there's life in outer space? Herr Director, thank you. Herr Doctor, uh, and all you future scientists. Um, the oldest of your generation here, my son Ben, is going to be attending Cosmos, which is the name of a program at UCSD, a uh, living, um, 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 one month living on the UCSD campus, um, studying all, all sorts of sciences and things like that. And of course, his brother Taryn there is quite a, quite a young scientist himself. And I, as I've gotten the impression some of you are, you're quite a young scientist, and are you, you too. I enjoyed dinner conversation with you two guys. Um, now, I, talk, I think about life in outer space a lot. Sometimes I think about stories about life in outer space, aliens and things like that, because I write science fiction stories. I write science fiction novels. And so that's wearing one hat as a storyteller. I switch hats so fast to different things like science and then science fiction that you see I've lost all my hair. <laughs> but um, the question of what is a out there, what's the alien out there? has only been very, very popular in the last hundred years because until a hundred years ago, people who told stories about the alien, about the strange creatures and things like that, they would set those stories in other parts of the earth. <coughs> did everybody know, bless you, did everybody know all the parts of the earth a hundred years ago? No, a well, a hundred years ago, actually, they were pretty close. A hundred years ago, there were a few jungles where there were a few places that people, that, that um, Europeans hadn't been yet. But a hundred and fifty years ago, there were whole large parts that weren't on the maps. Yes? Um, a hundred years ago was Pluto here? Well, Pluto was discovered, and I met the man who discovered Pluto. His name was Clyde Tombo. And, um... Gosh, well, I was about Ben's age when I met him, and I thought he was old then. <laughs> he only died a few years ago. He got a lot older. <laughs> but uh, yes, he worked for Percival Lowell. And Percival Lowell had the Lowell Observatory in, um, in, in, flat, in Arizona. You've been there. Oh, yeah? That's fabulous. And a U grad. <laughs> And when Clyde Tombo discovered Pluto, he named it Pluto for several reasons. Planets are named after Roman gods, right? Mars was the god of war. Yeah. Jupiter was the king of the gods. Oh. Saturn, yeah? I have a cool story about um, Jupiter. About Jupiter. But isn't Jupiter... But you're not Jupiter, you're Mars. Yeah. But I who's, know. who's Jupiter? 
That's right. So let let your brother tell the story. But it's um, historic, <laughs> <laughs> but it's historic um, story, not sciencey story. Oh, but so, it's all right. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, the planet Jupiter is actually named after the Greek god Zeus. But his Roman name was right, Jupiter. The, Roman, the Romans adopted the Greek gods when they. Yeah, and that's true. That's true. And then Zeus became Jupiter, and then the planet Jupiter got named. And Hermes, Hermes became what planet? Mercury, the messenger god, because it's fast. You see, Venus is the same as Aphrodite in Greek. So they, they, they exchanged names, they swapped names. Now he also named it Pluto not only because it was cold and because he liked Mickey Mouse cartoons, but also because Pluto, its symbol PL, stands for Percival Lowell, his boss. So always, always learn how to, uh, how to be political and, and get in good with your boss. Now, um, I'm going to pass the microphone over in a little while to the, your representative. We're going to work our way in the solar system. Your representative from the planet Pluto. He, in fact, some people think he was born there. But first, I want to talk about uh, how we changed our ideas of the alien from those days when people wrote stories where the alien, the strange creatures, were in the jungle, uh, here on Earth, or underwater, or you ever heard of Jules Verne's um, a book, uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, mm -hmm. or Voyage to the Bottom, uh, not uh, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, heard of that. Um, things like that. Well, there came a time when people started thinking in terms of aliens outside. Who can think of the first science fiction story that talked about Martians? What was it? Um, let's see. H.G. Wells. There was a movie not too long War ago. Of from the world. Very right. good. War of the, of the World. I read that book. I was trying to remember what it was called. Martians Invade the Earth. So there have been lots of different styles of aliens. There's the nasty kind that's coming to get us. And then there's the, uh, who can think of a movie that was one of the best movies about that? Uh, what? No, that's not about a nasty alien coming to get us. That's about kids hiding a, hiding a little friendly turtle alien from their own freely elected government. I always thought that movie was so weird. I mean, I, I really looked, I looked for it. Next time you see E.T., play, it, play the, the scene with all the tense tense music where you're all worried for the spaceship guys who are digging up our plants because people are, humans are running through the forest chasing after them. Oh, quick, get away, get away, you sweet little aliens. And if you look closely, if you play it at slow speed, you realize there are no guns. It's just human beings with flashlights and clipboards and cameras trying to find out what's going on. And yeah, why are you running away? <laughs> Why are you sneaking around in the dark in our forests? Creepy people do that. <laughs> and he runs away. The, the captain of the ship flies away, abandoning one of his crewmates and has to be called back. He doesn't even come back for him. <laughs> E.T. call home. Personally, I think the, they have the bad guys in that movie all wrong. But that's another story. No, Independence Day. Independence Day was a creepy, invading aliens, you know, nasty, vicious, invading aliens. And then there are sweet aliens, and then there's kind of uh, aliens that, uh, that you might want to have in space. The question is, how likely, yes? Um, there, even there could be an imaginary alien or a clone alien that can turn into any aliens. Well... One of the things that uh, I think about using my other hat as an astronomer is what kind of real aliens might be out there. And there's a group of people that have what's called the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, SETI. And they get these radio telescopes and they scan the sky. One of the world's richest men, Paul Allen, funded some new telescopes. And I know these people and they're scanning the sky, listening and recording on tapes to see if they can catch any radio waves from distant stars. And there's a lot of 
crackling going on out there, static crackling coming from the stars. But they're sifting in that cr static and seeing if any of it might be television from some far, far away planet. Or their, their TV shows or their radio shows. Or maybe a message aimed at us. So that's S-E-T-I, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And you can see that portrayed in the movie Cosmos. Cos there's that word again. Contact, right. Oh, yeah, sorry. It was Cosmos was the TV show, right. Contact. And you'll see that this uh, Jodie Foster plays um, was uh, a character that was modeled after Jill Tarter, who helps to run that program. So maybe, do you think that they might fly around in spaceships, like in Star Trek and the Star Wars? Yes. Well, you see, there's a real problem there. And that is that Einstein found that if you go faster and faster and faster and you get closer to the speed of light, it gets harder and harder and harder to push your spaceship. And the, the closer you get to the speed of light, the heavier your spaceship gets. That's what, what's weird. And so it gets harder and harder to push it. And how, who can tell me how long it takes light to come to, our, to us from the nearest star? Yes? The nearest star. You can't see it from here. You have to be down in, down in the southern hemisphere to see this one. It's called Alpha Centauri. That's not the nearest star. What about the sun? Well, Alpha Centauri. It's the sun. Oh, yeah, the sun, of course. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yes. How long does it take? He's a physicist? No, that, that, you're right, you're right. That is how long it takes light to get us from the nearest star, the sun. I meant the nearest real star. Angelina Jolie. Uh, <laughs> it's all completely imaginary. Yes. A really, 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 really long time. Oh, well, uh, for, you might think it's a really long time. It goes by in a flash for us old guys. Uh, who can tell me, Taryn? How long? Anybody? Oh, well, how long? Half an hour. No. That's how long it takes light to get to Earth from, say, Mars. Yes? Um, an hour. One day? Four years. It takes four years to li for light to reach our home from the nearest star that's not the sun. <laughs> Four years. And that's the nearest one. How many stars are there out there? A lot. Like millions? Billions and billions just in this galaxy. Excuse me, I have to say that right. Billions and billions of stars in just our one galaxy. How many galaxies are there? Billions. Billions and billions. So there are billions of galaxies. Each one has billions of stars. And the star that's closest to ours, the light takes four years. How long does it take other stars' light to get to us? Well, the, star from the, the light from the Andromeda galaxy takes a million years to get to us. And that's the closest galaxy. This, other than our galaxy. <laughs> You guys. What? No, we're in our galaxy, so it's not. So, so, can aliens fly around in spaceships just like in Star Trek and the Star Wars? Yes. No. Well, Maybe. according to our knowledge of science, it's a lot harder than that. Because the closest you, closer you get to the speed of light, the harder it is to push your spaceship. So you can't travel faster than light. So it would take you at least four years just to go to the nearest star. That's not what they do in Star Trek. In Star Trek, you see them flicking by, stars going by, like that, right? In Star Trek, they make two places and they make them closer together. That's called warp drive, and that's the escape. Maybe we might find a way to cheat Einstein. Deep. And if that happens, if that's possible, then aliens might be able to come here, or, which I think is more likely, we, some of you will go and visit them. If we start the adventure again, because when we were kids, 
we were all excited about the adventure of going into space. It was the most exciting thing. Are you kidding? Who here is seven years old? Eight? Seven or eight? When I was your age, the Sputnik went up. Who can tell me what the Sputnik was? What? It was a Russian spacecraft. It spacecraft? was the first ma a human launched satellite. And until then, there were no satellites. And nobody thought it was possible. Well, there were a few people who thought it was possible. Who here is, no, who here is 12? <laughs> All right. When I was your age, Yuri Gagarin went into and became the first human satellite. Yuri Gaga? Yuri Gagarin. He was Russian. <laughs> All right. So, the point is, the point is, it's very, very interesting out there in space, but it's so big. It's bigger than you can possibly imagine. But one of the fun things is to try to imagine. So, what, Taryn? Um, well, actually, the thing about the aliens having all those things, um, it's impossible because the universe started at all the same time. It's impossible for them to have the same things in it as, unless they started... But, but, but the difference between us and our great-grandparents is the tiniest amount of time, but we have a lot more technology than our great-grandparents. So, you know, the aliens could be ahead of us. All right, does anybody have any questions? Because um, we're going to start talking about the planets. Yeah? Um, like, when you, like, close your eyes and put it on um, for, like, two minutes... You can see a lot of stars. You Did see. I do that. And then we go around stars all around. Wow. Well, those are called entopic lights, and those are inside inside your eyeball. And you rub your eyeball, or you kind, of, or you just even if you're just paying attention inside your eyeball, you can see all sorts of amazing things. Yes. -E Search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Yeah. Maybe some way we could um, go really fast. We could go to some overlapping universe where the laws of physics are different and we could go really fast without slowing down. Oh, 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 that's very interesting. Maybe we could go to a different plane in our universe where everything is close together and then go over there and then go back in. That's to our about, universe. I was talking about like an overlapping universe. That's, like yeah, that's, that's one of the ideas that's out there. Where the what, laws of physics is, are different and you can go at light speed without freezing in time. It sounds to me like I have some competition. <laughs> what? what? I have some competition in the sci-fi game. I, uh, it, I like sci-fi a whole lot. You I do? I think about it too. Well, well. I'll have to get you a book. Yay. <laughs> uh, yes. When you, grew, when you were growing up, who were your favorite science fiction authors? My favorite science fiction authors when I was growing up? Well, I guess Robert Sheckley because of his wonderful short stories and Robert Heinlein, of course, because there was hardly anybody else around. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my kids gave me the longest stretch of unalloyed and uninterrupted respect that I ever got from all three of them at the same time when I took them to Ray Bradbury's house. And he stood up and he said, David, and there was actually 15 minutes stretch from each, from all three of them at the same time. <laughs> Huh? How old are you? How old am I? <laughs> All right. Well, I can only answer that in song. I can only answer that in song. What? I was born about 8,000 years ago, and there's nothing in this world that I don't know. I saw the Pharaoh's daughter pluck old Moses from the water, and I'll whoop the man who says it isn't so. <laughs> <laughs>